Namaste, Amy. Welcome. Namaste. Thank you so much for making time for Ahimsa Conversation. Such a pleasure to meet you again. It's um, wonderful to see you again. It's wonderful. So I many know. years. I know, ages. Uh, uh, such an extraordinary journey since then. Yes. Well, and yours, of course, is... Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's so inspiring to so many people. But then we are going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, Amy, what is your earliest recollection of either the experience or the concept of nonviolence, ahimsa? I was so intrigued with where my mind went when when I saw that you would be discussing this question, and and it does indicate the importance of some of those early childhood unspoken uh, words. I am the product of a marriage that took place after World War II. My mother volunteered, as did a great many teenagers, uh, after the war to go rebuild Europe as part of this massive Marshall Plan. She was assigned to an uh, orphanage in Naples, Italy. Uh, while there, she met a young man whom she subsequently married uh, and returned to America with. Uh, my father had uh, been living in Naples throughout the era of the you know, buildup of fascism and then uh, throughout the war. I was really about 10 years old before I knew that he had been alive prior to 1950. He never spoke of his childhood. He rarely spoke of his parents, his brothers, his life. Uh, and I got glimpses now and again, usually through overhearing adults, of terrible, terrible things that had gone on. Uh, when I was about 10, probably had had too much wine at dinner, he, he started telling a story that he kind of was, I don't know, matter of fact about where he had had to bring a dead baby to the mass burying site in Naples and, and how crowded the tram car had been and how difficult it had been to treat this little box with respect and love and this crowded situation and how he had finally gotten there and expected, you know, a moment of silence and a recognition of of the passing, but that the man had uh, taken the box and thrown it into the pile with all the other bodies. I was so... Thunder, I, I couldn't even conceive of, of a boy not much older than I was at that time having had that kind of experience and that and and it had the effect of making me very frightened. I, I didn't want my father to talk about anything that happened before 1950. I didn't want to learn the and I never asked him about them. but as I grew older and had children of my own, I wanted them to know something of him. And he voluntarily wrote a letter to my older son to share with his brother uh, when my older son was five, about his life when he was five, when my son was 10, about my father's life when he was 10, and 15. Now, my father's father had been a socialist, which was uh, an outlaw in the fascist era. He was the head of the local post office, which made him the head of a union, which made him a dangerous person. And they had been sent into exile in a criminal city that was in between halfway between Naples and Rome. When my father was five, he was quite terrified all the time and experienced violence during that period. Eventually, the family went underground and moved back to Naples and fought in the Italian resistance. Uh, so by the time my father was 10, um, he already had uh, a man living in hiding in 
what had been a closet and now was basically walled over in the family building. Man was the first violin player at the opera house in Naples and had be, been declared a criminal. And uh, my father wrote of these things to my son. And it was such a gift he gave me in my childhood that he didn't bring the kind of anger or the kind of, you, you know, you read so often about violence begetting violence and, 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 and he so deliberately set all those things aside and, and, and raised his children in, in a brand new way that he himself had never had the opportunity to live. Um, the letter, obviously, when he was 15, when the war was in full gear, was uh, the most shocking of the letters. And it, one of the anecdotes he, he shared was uh, that he and his brother had gone out. The big effort in Naples during that time was to turn on electricity so the Americans that bombed at night would know where the town was and keep their bombs on the harbor. And the um, government would try to turn the lights off so that they had a better chance of keeping the battleships. And so boys had gone out and attempted to turn the lights on. And uh, then they had gone into hiding in a, in a nunnery in a, with a bunch of Catholic nuns. And, and the um, nuns put him in the crypt, him and his brother in the crypt for the night. And in the morning, nobody opened the crypt and, and it, they had to struggle quite hard to get out of it and move a rock off of their surface. And they came up to find the nuns had all been hung from the church's rafters. Uh, it was stunning for me. I mean, he had been a cheerful, loving, you know, somewhat... Um, somewhat cynical but always in the most cheerful way of cynicism person and he had had such violence that he had protected us from and internal you know so i knew quite young that i was very afraid of violence and that i was that there was something mysterious there that my parents didn't speak of and that terrible things had happened and, and it scared me quite a lot. Uh, as I got older and more sophisticated and started, you know, even in school, you're asked to read things that are very eye-opening. And uh, it interested me more and more. Uh, then, um, as a teenager, uh, there, we, we started uh, the war in Vietnam. Um, my parents were very opposed to war. They were pacifist. They, they understood the concept of a just war, and they understood that fascism would have ended humanity in most senses of the word. But the war in Vietnam did not seem to rise to that level. And even if it had, I don't know if they could have forsaken their pacifism. Uh, so I, I never had a question about how I felt about that war because I was taught how to feel about that war. Uh, but it was clearly during the most formative years of my life. And um, I was in that year when it was high school boys in the, in the lottery to discover what their number would be for the draft. And that was kind of a go to war or not go to war um, moment in life. So uh, I was rather formed by these early discoveries and thoughts and things not said. Uh, other than that, a very conventional upbringing for Connecticut in the 1950s and 60s uh, with, you know, all of the gentle side of what those years could have meant to people. Mm. I'll stop there. And no. I mean, in this sequence, did Martin Luther King, because you would be a teenager perhaps mm -hmm, mm -hmm, at the mm -hmm. time of this, did the nonviolence dimension of uh, Dr. King yeah. uh, come Very through? Very much. 
Yes, and, very, and when, very much. And when would be the first time that you would have heard of Gandhi? In 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 that entire uh, frame of, of, I mean, I can't tell you the first time, but certainly it was well established by the time. Uh, so the 60s were, of course, a period where it wasn't just the war in Vietnam. We had a, a civil rights uh, dialogue going on in this country that was quite comprehensive. I came from a small town in Connecticut. Uh, in that town, there was a hospital, and at that hospital worked a janitor who was the only African American in our town, except for his wife and his 10 children. Uh, they were the oldest was my age, and uh, I'm still in occasional communication with him. He's now a radio producer. And they um, were our only connection there. And yet, because of this national unrest and interest and things, certainly, I mean, we all participated in, in rallies for racial justice, parades for racial justice, the you know, in those days, you'd have a hoot nanny, which was a sing along, where we would all sing these uh, praises to peace and justice. And and when the Reverend Martin Luther King was shot, uh, it was well. I, I think maybe the shooting of of JFK of of John President John Kerry. Kennedy was the uh, only other such shocking experience in not only my life, but in America's life uh, until that point. It's a different sort of violence that went on. It was very out of sight for many. You were either in the middle of it or not. And um, I... I uh, was assigned in high school the assignment of of uh, why were there riots in the cities, and each child had to talk about some aspect. And my assignment was the educational system. And as I reviewed reporting at the time on the differences in education. See, this hadn't been my experience in Newtown. We didn't have a special school for the 10 children of this one man. We, so I hadn't had the the experience that cities were having. And and, the, and it was even to a youngster, a very um, shocking set of information. Uh, that, that era definitely was one of great hope and and in spite of the fact that you very often, when you see videos of what was going on at the time, it appears as though people were fighting and it was violent. But it wasn't for those of us going through it. We were very much a lovey-dovey kumbaya kind of, um, kind of inspired and aspirational, hopeful for the future uh, generation. Now, I might borrow another moment of your uh, question there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, maybe your first question there um, to expand. Please, please do. The, the, um, the town that I grew up in was a farm town. It had 4,000 people. It was cows mostly, um, dairy cattle. And we had... Um, you know, all that kind of idealistic childhood going ice skating wherever the water formed and was frozen enough, whether it was a ditch or whatever. And all the um, perfect um, innocence of that era. Uh, a number of, about 20 years ago, I was uh, at a corporate holiday party and um, my husband rang me about six times and I, I knew he knew I was at this party. So I thought something has to be going on. And I um, picked up the phone and he said to me, uh, have you seen any news? 
I said, no, I've been at the holiday party. And, and he said, you better leave the party. And I, I walked out and I found a new, uh, uh, the shooting had taken place in my hometown. And in my own school where I had sung, God bless America, second and first graders had been slaughtered by a young man with a gun. So um, as a professional, I had never, I had always used principles of pacifism uh, in the investment process. But at that point, we at my firm at Domini Impact Investments, we committed ourselves to also using our shareholder voice to attempt to address issues of gun violence in America. I can't say we've been terribly successful at it, but we've certainly had our minor successes along the way. So, yeah, of course, your uh, your consciousness about uh, structural violence, I, I, know, I know from our previous conversations, uh, was there even in the early days of your becoming a stockbroker. You know, I know you've, uh, you know, you've often spoken about your restlessness, yes. that the values you cherished in your own life and at home and in your neighborhood were at odds, you felt with the job you were doing. But I think there was a specific incident, right, to do with a armament company that was your turning no, well, point. Yeah, can, I, yes. can I request you to share that story? Because uh, I've yeah. always found it fascinating that the final, I think, tipping point for you had to do again with really a massive example of structural violence. Yes. Well, I... I through a series of mishaps, found myself in, in the business of, of what was then called a stock broker, a person who would recommend to others a stock that they might purchase. And the methodology for discovering what stock to recommend uh, was that in the morning, uh, each morning of the week, there would be a, a some smart person in New York City getting on a loudspeaker, which we called the squawk box, and making a case uh, that, that there would be an important announcement and this was going to be very good for a certain company and we would all want to own that company at that point in time. And uh, one day it was uh, an announcement about the um, Navy uh, making certain decisions as to what they would be purchasing. And uh, I got on the phone very dutifully and started calling people and saying that this would, and one of them pushed back and said, they make bombs. <laughs> and, I, and it had never, the, my personal feelings and the war in Vietnam was still very alive in that in that era. I mean, it was a very recent um, experience for us all. It had not occurred to me that I was casual about making bombs in in this regard, and I started asking people that I worked with um, clients, uh, is there a place that you would draw the line? And I found that there were many places that people would draw the line. Not long thereafter, I, I found myself in a meeting for the local chaplaincy of the Episcopal chaplain at, at uh, Harvard and Radcliffe. We were discussing the investments that the chaplaincy had. And amongst the investments were U.S. Treasury bonds, and and I said, you know, with the chaplaincy's commitment to peace and justice, and, and with its uh, you know longstanding uh, feeling that we should have avoided the war in Vietnam, is, is this an appropriate investment? <laughs> and the priest kind of was taken aback and. and 
he sort of laughed at me and it, oh that's a that's a good idea you know and and I uh, said well no I mean I think it's really valid I hadn't hadn't thought of it myself but I've been talking with my clients and and actually most people do have places that they don't want to invest and weapons is pretty much the number one thing and I, he said oh really you should write a book about that <laughs> and I was kind of annoyed <laughs> and I thought I'm going to write a book about that <laughs> and 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 it sort of was the genesis of my writing the book ethical investing which introduced to a much broader audience the concept that um, the way you invest shapes things, has impacts in the world. And you're, you're not just complicit, you're aiding and abetting uh, with the investments you make. So it was, uh, in a way, kind of the launch of many ships. <laughs> yeah. And also the apartheid, anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, did yeah. that run, was that already happening where investment and boycotts of companies or shareholder activism to end apartheid, uh, was that already happening or did it then get going around the same time that your book came out? Well, uh, the system of apartheid in South Africa, apartheid meaning separateness, separate development for the blacks and the whites in South Africa, had been going on since colonial era and had been um, increasingly uh, known throughout the world. And part of the reason it was increasingly known throughout the world was that the um, British in South Africa had planted their church there. And the Anglican communion had an active presence and it had uh, a, a reverend, the Bishop, Desmond Tutu, who um, traveled as all Anglican bishops do every four years to Canterbury Cathedral in England. While there, he appealed to the Anglican communion globally to do what they could to help his people. That is one of the powerful tools of religion that is so often overlooked. It is global. They each faith communicates within itself and within an interfaith community and brings forward these issues that are very granular, tiny issues in some way, you know, only specific to one country. After that uh, appeal went out, the members of the Episcopal Church in America, which is part of the Anglican Communion, uh, thought to themselves, well, you know, the largest uh, American company doing business there is General Motors. It's an American company. General Motors, in very recent history, uh, uh, elected an African-American preacher to their board of directors. That was the result of pressure that grew out of the 1960s and efforts of Ralph Nader to diversify boards of directors. And we should go to the general meeting, uh, the annual meeting of General Motors and express our opinion that they should get out of South Africa. And the presiding bishop did. And he went to that meeting in 1971 and at that meeting, the newly elected African-American preacher, the Reverend Liam Sullivan, stood up and said, I think General Motors can do better than leave. I think it can make things better in South Africa. I'm going to start attempting to do that. And he came up with a code of conduct for companies there. The code of conduct included uh, the agreement to answer questionnaires annually. By the time I started writing Ethical Investing in roughly 1978-79, that code of conduct had been adhered to, written up, reports were coming out for about five years, five or six years. 
and it was very specific. Questions like how many blacks supervise how many coloreds and how many whites. That was the vocabulary at the time. And the answers were increasingly discouraging. And the difficulty General Motors and other companies were having in seeing actual improvement in the position of blacks and coloreds in South Africa was becoming more and more obvious. So a divestment movement, getting finally to your question, did evolve. Uh, the reason I'm taking so long about this is this is the same pattern that was followed in the d discussion today about climate change and the role of fossil fuels. Yeah. Years of dialogue, years of trying to track information, finally a divestment movement, which has a moral argument to it. It is wrong to participate in profits being made over a system of slavery, in a system of slavery. And uh, as that uh, grew, as that divestment movement grew, it, it wasn't just investors, it was sports teams not willing to play sports there. It was uh, police departments not willing to buy General Motors cars because they did business in South Africa or IBM typewriters because they did business in South Africa. And those various boycotts fueled each other. And that dialogue got to the point where you couldn't sit on the board of a library investment committee or the Episcopal chaplaincy at Harvard and Radcliffe or uh, some school board without having a serious discussion about whether or not you should be invested in companies doing business in South Africa, which meant every American was aware of what was going on in South Africa and discussing it. And meanwhile, in South Africa, there was some violence, there were some, but when you consider what was going on in Latin America, the slaughter there through much of this period, in Cambodia with the Khmer Rouge through much of this period, there was an outsized focus that resulted from investor, what began as an investor boycott. And in fact, there was a transition of power in South Africa from the minority to the majority, 27 million people got the vote peacefully. It was an extraordinary example of the ability to have a, a terrific idea based on a moral decision that joined faith community, business community, ordinary citizens, baseball stars, uh, together in a single statement. It's wrong to make money that way. Um, it was a name and shame campaign. Uh, the crescendo of American businesses doing work in South Africa, being divested from investment portfolios was about 1985-6. That was the lead year. By that time, my book had been published. Uh, and as all of these groups debated whether or not uh, they should divest too or something, they did look around and try to find some expert. And I had just written the book. So I was very much um, out speaking and advocating and, and, and uh, talking about how the investment portfolio could also seek justice for 27 million people who didn't have a vo vote who didn't have a voice in, in decisions that affected their lives very profoundly. Uh, and that argument as to whether or not investors could do more than just piggyback on corporate earnings, but could actually make the world a better place, really was launched in that South African debate. And then you went on, you and many others, because I know by then it was a community, uh, to build upon this experience and 
the socially responsible investing movement as a much larger phenomenon was born. I've always yes. seen that movement as a response to uh, the structural violence of the uh, economic system. Uh, yes. I, I know you well have said. seen it. You've seen it yeah. that way very much yeah. too. Uh, can you uh, now share a brief overview of how you sought, what were the ways in which some of the examples, you know, through the 90s, uh, before yes. we take a kind of retrospective look at how you feel today, but I'm just saying mm. if we could first cover uh, what were some of the ways in which SRI sought to stand up to this structural violence and overturn it if possible? Uh, yes, I, I think it, it's useful to drop back and, and discuss what responsible investing encompasses. Um, the tools that we primarily rely upon. A and those tools are, are three. Uh, one is we make selections about what to purchase based on an effort to be amongst the better half, not the best of the best, not the perfect, but amongst the better companies in terms of impact on people and the planet. There's a phrase in Europe, people, the planet, and profits, triple P, bottom line. And uh, that would be uh, the core of it with regard to whether it's a profitable opportunity, whether or not it's adding value to the lives of people and whether or not it's at least not horrifically negative for the survival of the planet. Uh, that's one tool. Another tool is your shareholder. A shareholder has a, a unique voice. We learned that in South Africa. We were able to go to the annual meeting of General Motors and hundreds of other companies and discuss the roles that those companies had in the development of and the ever firming, firming grip of apartheid in South Africa. That voice as a shareholder can be through a very formal process of filing a resolution that all shareholders will vote on whether or not the company should change its behavior. And because we're allowed to do that, we can take a softer approach also of dialogue with the company to see where that dialogue will lead. Uh, and, and that advocacy role of responsible investors is the second tool we have. The third is a more direct watering the grassroots, um, supporting community development financial institutions, having a deposit with a credit union that serves an at-risk population of one sort or another, making a loan to a charitable organization that does the same. Maybe specific venture capital into something that is of high social impact, although that could just be uh, the same as deciding what to invest in, in the first category. Um, these three tools are, are what we have. Now, through the years, how have we been able to use them? The Im most important thing about buying better, in addition to reducing your complicity with the uh, economic violence that, that companies produce, you are also uh, raising a good deal of awareness about what the company's impact is. In the good old days, before companies got so sophisticated, if I were to call up and ask a company, you know, I'd like to know something about what programs you might have, uh, to um, higher disenfranchised populations in Chicago where your headquarters is. The investor relations person would be dumbfounded and say, uh, I'll get somebody to call you back. <laughs> somebody who called me back was almost invariably the treasurer of the company or the lawyer for the company. 
and I was able to talk about what we were doing and why we were doing it and why our interests were there. And they would talk about what the company was doing. It was a seminar for one. It was a seminar for top management to learn that there were investors who cared about these kinds of issues. Uh, and now, of course, um, very well known, uh, virtually all of the larger companies in the world have a second report that reports these kinds of things out. And uh, governments around the world have either implemented or are in the process of implementing uh, standards for reporting on these subjects. Now, there's an old phrase that says, oh dear, or now I've forgotten it, that which is counted. <laughs> But it, there is a certain amount of fact. If you have to report on the fact that last year you, your carbon emissions were X, Y, and Z, and this year they're 10% higher, that's a report you don't want to make. And you, and you focus on how to run your business so as to not make that report. So I think of the actual just buying better companies and the infrastructure it puts into place as an extremely valuable tool. More specifically, if you want to go to a fine point, how did we get to the vote in South Africa? We largely got to the vote in South Africa through an international boycott. How did we get to an international boycott? We largely got there through shareholder dialogue, talking to companies, saying sign these Sullivan principles, report on them, do better by them, Year after year, it would, the, the ask would get greater. Uh, and we would learn from all of that. The um, process of doing that uh, taught me that there could be other ways of, of um, and even as recently as within the last, say, since Newtown, <laughs> uh, we scan the companies we own for opportunities. We don't buy guns. We never have. We don't buy weapons. We never have. But we do invest in companies that sell things. So we were able to address these companies that sell things and, and say, do you realize that you're selling this or this and what it does? Uh, an, an example, and, and I don't really want to name names too often, but we did uh, approach Amazon and say, you know, you're selling things that are advertised as making your conventional gun, essentially a machine gun, uh, allowing it, you click it on and it allows your trigger to rapid fire. Uh, this is not only circumnavigating local law, but also uh, not the kind of product we think is helpful to society. Uh, and uh, they did remove those vendors from their uh, network and they did refine their standards as to what they would sell. But they do uh, still did. sell guns in the US. Oh yes, no, I'm saying at a specific company, Amazon, mm -hmm. a specific product mm -hmm. was removed. Mm -hmm. Guns in the US, we're going the wrong way on. Um, you elect a Democrat, everybody buys guns because they're going to do away with, Democrats are going to do away with guns. You elect a Republican, everybody buys guns because it's the last chance. It's very, very discouraging. Um, but we have been able to use our our voice, in addition to just using stock selection, we've been able to have specific conversations with specific companies. You know, we write a letter thanking Dick's Sporting Goods for removing the military style weapons from their sporting goods stores. We, we, we keep up in, in an active way on that regard. Uh, it's going to be a very long struggle here in this country as far as the guns uh, go, but certainly investors are very, very investors have largely lost interest in complicity with it. And, and most of the gun manufacturers have now become private companies. Right. Uh, 
I mean, in terms of the structural violence that uh, you set out to address through SRI, uh, in many ways, that structural violence has, you know, come home in the form of climate change or what is now more accurately called climate chaos, right? Yeah. Uh, and in the same 40 years that this amazing work uh, with impact investing happened, uh, as a species and as a community of nations, we have missed many important you know, deadlines uh, to uh, take action uh, on climate. Uh, so how do you feel today? Uh, you know, one of the earlier conversations in this series was with Nick Robbins, who was part of the UNEP study on uh, responsible investing. He now teaches at LSC. And he said something very hopeful. He said, I think we are at the beginning, uh, sorry, we're at the end of the beginning okay. of the turnaround. Mm -hmm. So he says, he says we should not lose hope. And we've just now closing the beginning phase in a sense, the infancy. And now this will mature and uh, you know, bring about much bigger and more profound change. So mm -hmm. what is your feeling? How do you see your the, the prospects for the next 40 years? Well, um, we clearly need to move very quickly. I am extremely encouraged by the uh, initiatives that Joe Biden is attempting to put into place. <laughs> I am extremely encouraged by the initiatives the, United, the European Union has put into place and that individual nations are picking up and moving forward in their uh, specialized way. We have a constant struggle. You know, one nation will plant a million trees and another will take them down in a weekend. So we have a, a constant struggle going on here. Uh, but it, it, it's very provocative, this concept of the end of the beginning. Um, we have gotten to the point now where it is very obvious. And I, you know, the, the argument what I heard here in America was, uh, and I, I will just back up and say, uh, Domini Impact Investments, twin goals are universal human dignity, ecological sustainability. So we, every investment we make is after analyzing the ecological sustainability the universal human dignity and ecological sustainability implications of that investment. So that uh, climate change has been front and center, what it means for indigenous populations, what it means for hunger gl globally, what it means for uh, simple things like uh, losing your home in a flood or losing your home in a fire. I mean, which are, uh, it, done in an hour uh, yeah. and where we um, stand now is that we are not hearing the pushback that we used to hear there used to be oh I think it's El Nino it's this you know phenomena of the Pacific Ocean being warm every few years that throws up a weird pattern of weather then that gradually changed and said, well, there is climate change, but there were, there's always been climate change that happens. It's uh, not caused by carbon. It's not caused by carbon. Now, you're not even hearing it's not caused by carbon. Um, people are saying, well, screw that. I need my car anyway. But... <laughs> But they're not denying that there is climate change. It's very dramatic and that it's man-made. Uh, and the grown-ups in the room are, are beginning to mobilize uh, very strongly to attempt to uh, address and reduce it. Now, this has given um, the 
responsible investors tremendous opportunity. I don't know that climate change had anything to do with uh, the advent of COVID on the world, but as uh, COVID found its way through populations globally, it, like climate change, it forced populations, cities, towns, down to the granular level, all the way up to the multilateral level uh, to consider um, a way out, a, a means of dealing. And in the investing community, it was actually, uh, this past year was actually a fabulous year for the responsible investor because all the kinds of things that the responsible investor has been interested in and tilted toward suddenly became important things. We at Domini recognized, as, as some companies did, it was a tremendous demand in our employee base for a kinder work environment. Uh, not so much travel to the office every day of the week, not this terrible um, in-person thing where you, you kind of gave up your child's school play because you were, you know, doing Cincinnati that afternoon. Uh, and we felt that a company, which we are using right now, Zoom, <laughs> uh, offered the kind of technology that was a solution for corporations that wanted to give their employees an option to work in a way that was better for their families and better for their lifestyle. And so we had been drawn to that kind of a company. That company had a plan. And that plan was a 10-year plan. How many people would use their product over the next 10 years, how they would grow that product. Along came COVID. And that 10-year plan became a 10-month plan. All of a sudden, <laughs> everything. And you saw it in, in company after company that investors uh, of our sort are naturally drawn to. The company that installs solar roofs in California, Sunrun, increased tenfold. The, the company at Tesla uh, that kind of made every other car company looked dumb for saying electric cars were too hard to build in a cost-effective way and people wouldn't buy them and so forth. They all hit their 10-year goals in a year. <laughs> and, yeah. and that is now baked in. So I do think that the field addresses uh, global challenges, the kinds of th the climate change challenge, a uh, COVID kind of challenge, it, it, it looks at the world in the same, in a kind of a crisis mode mm -hmm. and comes up with solutions to invest in. And if there aren't solutions, then moves to the dialogue side. Now, uh, you raise climate change, the most obvious issue in climate change my industry is focused on is fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, back um, when I got started, uh, we had a position that we took about what we would purchase and there were certain things we wouldn't purchase. We wouldn't purchase uh, products that were addictive and harmed person other than the addict. <laughs> we wouldn't um, make purchases of items of companies that made items that killed people when used as directed. <laughs> um, these were fairly simple, but they eliminated alcohol, tobacco, mm -hmm. gambling, and weapons. Uh, but then we were trying to find the better half of the remaining industries and certain industries would be very problematic. And far and away, the most problematic was petroleum. We didn't get a lot of pushback from investors saying, don't buy an oil company. That sophistication hadn't emerged, but we couldn't find one to buy because they had perfectly awful 
people and the planet implications. Their workforce was dying like flies. <laughs> they have terrible health and safety records in their workforce. They had terrible impact on indigenous populations. And many of them were working with warlords around the world that were suppressing human rights and freedom in order to get the petroleum that we needed to drive our little cars around. And they had ever better technologies for getting at less and less quality products and just burning off the leftovers into the atmosphere and re releasing carbons everywhere. That dialogue over how terrible their business model was went on for longer than South Africa, went on for more like 15 years, but like South Africa followed the pattern of eventually getting a charismatic leader uh, who argued that it was a moral imperative to divest of corporations that were in the exploration and production of oil and gas business. And that divestment movement has become a major movement and is um, moving on. Now we have the largest extraction company in Australia today announcing that they're going to uh, get out of the petroleum business. It's not cost effective. <laughs> they didn't want to admit it was not planet effective, but <laughs> I guess because they could have gotten a, a lot of cheers if they had said it's not right, but instead they chose to say it's not cost effective. It, it's a pattern that you see, and and I think it does uh, indicate the power of, of investing to uh, address these kinds of terrible issues we face as a planet. But on the human dignity front, Amy, we are seeing, uh, in fact, at the same time, in because of COVID uh, and the kind of enormous uh, livelihood and economic suffering that the lockdowns have caused, that right here in, in India, we, you know, we are afraid now that uh, anywhere from, I mean, hundreds of millions of people will be pushed back, are already pushed back into poverty. People who had risen above the poverty lines. And while this is happening, stock markets are going up, up and away. So I, I wonder, is this globally true that the disconnect between the real economy that puts food on people's table and clothes on their back and safe homes, is it so completely delinked from the, uh, you know, the, the world of the uh, stock markets? And if that is still the case, then how do we, I mean, can impact investing help us out of this? I, I think, I think your um, insight is uh, right on target. We, we have, um, as you say, the, the economy of Main Street and the economy of Wall Street, and, and they have um, become more disconnected. And there are some very moments in history where you can see that happening. Little changes, we tinker around with the rule and and that allows speculators to move in and that allows, we made a rule that it was okay to not only charge 1% or some amount to manage people's assets, it was also okay to share in their profits. That was against the law. We changed the law we allowed the hedge funds and we created the billionaires as, as a population. Um, and we have not shared in their wealth because we changed the tax laws. So, so there are things that we as a society have done to create this disconnect that can be undone, will be extremely difficult to undo, but should be undone. On the other hand, there is a strong connect. Um, the examples I, I gave a few minutes ago about how, what a strong market it was for responsible investors as COVID rolled through. Um, these, these companies were real answers to real world problems and, and came along and, 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 and solved it. And, and 
you can just scratch the surface on 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 this but in the medical community i can wear a little my father was a diabetic you know the needle and the all of that gone there's a little patch you look at your iphone and you see how your sugar is deal with it done yeah this is something that of course here in america we have this bizarre medical system of reimbursements that we wouldn't have been reimbursing that except that covid came along and we didn't want nurses getting covid because they were checking people's blood sugar so we started reimbursing this device that's worn on the arm and the 10 year plan became the 10 month plan for that company it issue after issue that that happened so this is a way of saying yes there's a terrible disconnect but there's also an important connect and i think that that is um one of the reasons that now i mean the most extraordinary embracing of of environmental and social criteria having a place in the investment decision making process has taken place i mean i am uh a user of a bloomberg and facts and the various tools that people in the world of finance use to check up what's going on in the stock market i get research from the big firms goldman sachs jp morgan whatever all of them every single one of them morning star everything now has environmental and social research available for me to review right along with what their earnings were last quarter uh that is a change that's extraordinary but would not have happened had not the value added become obvious to the investing professional and it has become obvious so it's now universal that's right and and it's very largely because of the work that you and your peers did is that very satisfying do you uh, do you feel more happy with what has been achieved than uh, the sense of because i picked up shades of the anxiety that you have for what is not done but how does it balance out right uh, you know and that's the day of the week you know is it too little too late or is there, or are we really going to solve this problem um i like to say when i'm talking to an audience that needs inspiring uh the the in america the women didn't get the vote because a woman chained herself to the courthouse door you know women got the vote because of that because of women with sophistication in legislative affairs because of women who served their husband a little rum in his tea and talked to him about the importance of it <laughs> there were thousands of little efforts yeah. that went into or big efforts that went into it and and that's what a social movement takes it takes the gentle push it takes the academic framework it takes the violent push it take and as these things come together what was missing for years and years was the investor push and investors are are unique today if 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 i were to say how do you solve a problem like climate change well you need global involvement well how do you get global involvement we don't have a global government we don't have a global legal structure we don't have we've got the united nations they've been addressing climate change since 1989 it's since the first opec they've been addressing it so how uh is it the consumer an enlightened consumer well i you know last i checked more people smoked yesterday than the day before i i can't count on the enlightened consumer to you know save me from something or um investors are linked globally they are have endless resources resources 20 30 40 times larger than global gdp they have instantaneous and near perfect knowledge on vast 
aspects of life. A car crashes on a highway and that car happens to be a self-guided vehicle. And there's a short seller in Malaysia, bang, 40 seconds later, responding to this information, moving markets as a result of it. You have a beautiful system in place as a tool for making the world a better place. So when I say, have I, do I look back with satisfaction? I think I've engaged, I've been an important voice in engaging that tool and bringing that power to this dialogue. If it's too little, too late, I've done my best. But I don't know that we could ever have a hope of achieving universal human dignity and ecological sustainability in an environment where investing was no rules, no checks and balances, only make money, because you, it's always cheaper to have a slave. It's always cheaper yeah. to, to, to throw your trash well, over. To not fence. care, basically. Yeah. To not and, care. and you had to rein that in. Yeah. And investors have chosen to rein themselves in. Mm. So, Amy, in closing, what uh, advice or what inspiration would you share with, say, somebody who is 25 today, where you were back in, you know, mm -hmm. 75? Um, what would you say? People who want to, and I meet a lot of young people who are, you know, pre-committed to being part of the solution, to countering the structural violence, but they sometimes they feel daunted that given <laughs> the odds is, is a more non-violent way of life really possible, but they want to work for it. So what are some of yes. the strengths? What are some of the energies? What are some of the, uh, you know, special inner uh, resources that they could cultivate that, uh, you know, you could guide them to? Yeah. Uh uh, I, I benefited personally very much from my naivete. I, I was too innocent to recognize that what I was attempting to do was a job. Um, I was too innocent to recognize that I had no business writing a book about investing. I had uh, no business um, deciding that certain investments were unsuitable in any circumstance <laughs> that I that I had uh, I, I I I do think that the um, threat is is to be um, a little too sophisticated and too knowledgeable about and maybe, you know, it's ironic, but maybe a great model for uh, young people is, is the um, TikTok influencer or the Instagram influencer. But here you're looking at somebody who's 15 years old and, and an inspiration to, you know, 20,000 people. Uh, they didn't have any special tools. They didn't, you know, you can have that inspiration be your voice and your message. And, and it can be a message for peace and for nonviolence and for universal human dignity and even ecological sustainability. I, um, there, there is a lot of, I'm, I'm running into every day of the week, uh, uh, I'll digress for one moment and say my next door neighbor is 15. Please. Um, he, he said he'd like to talk to me about stocks. So I said, okay, we'll sit down. We'll talk. We, and, and he said uh, that he was uh, reading everything people had to say on Reddit about stocks. <laughs> I don't know what's Reddit. Well, Reddit's is humongous, you know, but <laughs> He, he um, had uh, actually been writing with people and he actually had, you know, 800 or so people 
who liked to hear what he had to say on uh, in a forum about stuff, you know, 15 years old. So I, I do think that there are emerging ways of um, influencing that we haven't, well, we old fogies haven't uh, recognized or integrated into ourselves. I felt that finance was uh, a beautiful tool for the reasons that I've just spelled out. It's it's universal. It's big. It's it's where the money is. Uh, but that isn't the only path that can be taken. Um, traditionally, we've also talked about you know the kinds of things like religion. Uh, those are global initiatives where there's a shared value and 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 where people have a common understanding and each of the major religions of the world has a golden rule you know do unto others as you would have done unto yourself so we have a, a shared language through through religion so there are methodologies it's um awfully easy to just say I'm a nothing and I can't do it and I'm not any good at it or anything like that. But but if you can maintain a little naivete and just say, oh, I'll try it, <laughs> it will help. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I it's been you. such a pleasure to see you and to be here with you. Mm -hmm.